the LBMA inventory is down. The COMEX inventory is down. And what's really not talked about enough, in my view, is that the ETF inventories are down. So the supply has to come from somewhere, and I would suggest it's coming from the LBMA, the COMEX, and the ETFs. The problem is, how do you keep it this low in price and meet that demand? This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 12th through February 19th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver philharmonics at $3.15 over spot with a minimum order of 50. We also have pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 liberties at $99 over melt and $145 over melt respectively. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always privileged to have this distinguished returning guest. David Morgan is the founder of TheMorganReport.com. He's also known as the Silver Guru. He joins us this Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. David, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Well, David, it's always a pleasure to be back. Thank you. You and I have talked about many topics regarding precious metals over the years since we met almost a decade ago at the first Liberty Mastermind Symposium in Dallas, Texas, where you were a keynote speaker. And at that at that event, I remember you starting off trying to set a perspective for people on the overall above ground supply of silver, the mining output, the, the consumption, industrial demand, investment demand, etc. And my mind was greatly expanded in that hearing you give that presentation because I had never had anyone give such a sort of high level comprehensive overview that really expanded my view of the whole picture. And we've had a couple of clients asking recently some very detailed questions about where is all the silver coming from to meet growing demand. We've had the Silver Institute recently announce an expected spike in uh, demand, which has been growing for years with solar applications, etc. Maybe you'll touch on that. But also uh, we've seen some dwindling stockpiles in the COMEX and other uh, warehouses, but not enough to fulfill this burgeoning industrial demand that somehow is is continually being met. And there's still, at the moment, uh, apparently plentiful investable retail silver uh, for the for the buying public, which has, by and large, not w- awakened yet to the fact that they better get some while there's still some to be gotten. But could you address that broader question of where do, what do we know about where the silver is coming from to meet the growing demand? And do we expect that trend of growing demand to continue? Yeah, very good question. And uh, I'm going to give you a really long answer, but I think it's important. And it's basically a summary of what you just spoke of earlier that, you know, what I lectured on those 10 years ago. So there has been a guy, there's a guy that uh, works with Miles Franklin. And he goes by Silver Slayer. And he, I don't have time to listen to all the silver commentators. I just really don't. But I happened to listen to one of his commentaries, and it was uh, regarding another um, commentator in the silver world. And he's basically sp- spoke, excuse me, speaking that there's never been a deficit before, <clears throat> and that's fundamentally incorrect. So to set the record straight, in fact, I reached out to him and uh, never got a response, and he's busy. I'm not. I'm not here to critique him. He was just basically um, summarizing what another person had put in writing, which is very inaccurate. So if you just go to what I consider modern times, which means my lifetime, the biggest silver deficit we've ever experienced in my lifetime was from 1990 to 2005 inclusive. In 1990, the above ground silver supply, and when I say silver, I'm referring to 1,000 ounce commercial bars, was 2 billion ounces. And the average drawdown or deficit, so for supply and demand to equal, they have to come from somewhere. And if you're not mining and recycling as much as demand has, it has to be drawn down from above ground inventory. So from 1990 to 2005, the average drawdown was 100 million ounces a year. 
And that was 15 consecutive years in a row. And we went from 2 billion ounces above ground supply to 500 million. We had eaten up from above ground supply 1.5 billion ounces of silver. And yet, if you look at the price chart in 2005, silver is about eight bucks. Even though, so you, you asked the supply demand question. I mean, if you'd lost that much wheat or that much, you know, oil or any other commodity on the board, and you'd lost, you know, three quarters of it over a 15 year period, and it was known amongst the commodities people, I doubt you would see a price as low as silver was. But regardless, that's what happened. Now, from 2006 until the last year or so, we've been building in sorry, above ground. And we've gone back to about 2.5 billion ounces. There's no perfect number. Some people just make them up. I try to you know, cite all my work, but there's a difference between what the Silver Institute says, Metals Focus says, and CPM Group says. So I try to just kind of give a, a stab in there where they're all pretty much within a ballpark of that number. So if you want to ask, is the supply growing or dwindling, and you look at the above ground supply as the only way to measure it, the answer has been growing. And part of the reason was the Industrial Revolution in China. And when did that start? I don't know. No one has an exact date. You see the early 2000s. And there was a commodities boom, a super cycle. I mean, the Chinese needed copper, iron ore, tin, nickel, silver, you know, concrete, lumber. I mean, you name it. Any commodity across the board was very, very much in demand for what was a build out. 15 years, 20 years, you know, but that ceased, uh, not come to a zero, but the growth factor is certainly less than it was during the, the heyday of the Chinese build out. So now we come to your question and or the people's question, and that is, you know, where's the inventory coming from? Well, first of all, you know, the deficit that the Silver Institute refers to is valid there's been more offtake in either investment or industry than there's been mining, supply, and recycling. So that number is valid. And you, what we have to do is look at the obvious, which I'm pretty sure you imply, and that is, a oh, wait a minute, the LBMA inventory is down. The COMEX inventory is down. And what's really not talked about enough, in my view, is that the ETF inventories are down. So the supply has to come from somewhere, and I would suggest it's coming from the LBMA, the COMEX, and the ETFs. The problem is, how do you keep it this low in price and meet that demand? Which has always been the really big question if you think about it. Because even though the paper markets rule the silver market more than any other futures market, the paper market still, or maybe oil's more manipulated than silver, believe it or not. Regardless, that's an academic question. But back on track, <clears throat> the futures market runs all the commodities. So the big question is, what is the key? And the key is that the demand on the investment side the last couple of years has been retail. If you go back to 2020, the demand for silver on the institutional side was 320 million ounces. And if we go back in time and look at the Davos, now better known as the World Economic Forum, and uh, Bloomberg's finance guys were there interviewing different people. I inter interviewed a gentleman named Scott Meaner, who was the chief investment officer for Guggenheim. And they asked him, what's his go-to investment in 2020? And his answer was silver. They just about fell off their chairs. And 320 million ounces was bought in the ETFs that year. Uh, Scott Meenard is no longer with us. I'm not saying that Guggenheim bought all of that. But what I am suggesting is it's very unusual to have the rallies that we've had from 2020 till now. And yes, it's gone up and down, but there's been substantive rallies that any algorithm would pick up on. And yet the institutions that run those algorithms don't seem to be playing the game. Because if they were playing the game, 
the ETFs would be added to like they were in 2020, and they are not. They are draining out. So it doesn't make any sense as far as what the institutions are doing. So I could suggest for your consideration, asking yourself, why are they giving up silver out of those locations? And you can answer your own questions. Is that the last, you know, is that the last resort? You can't get it from anywhere but an ETF, uh, the LBMA or COMEX. Certainly most retail and institutions, I mean, there's big family offices and some sovereign wealth funds and some pension funds that own silver. Very, very few, but some. And usually these are very tightly held. And they're not willing to depart with silver at $23 an ounce when the average price for a primary silver producer is about the same. I mean, that's a break even. You don't invest to break even. You invest especially in silver for economic uncertainty. So I think I answered the question. It doesn't make sense. Institutions are not participating. I mean, if you want to put on a tinfoil hat, you might even ask this question. You know, has the word been put out to not to touch the silver market on an institutional basis? You know, I don't know. I'm not suggesting that's true. I just... Now, I'm opening up my thought pattern to everybody that's watching Liberty and Finance right now because the amount of offtake is so strong that the price not to move can only be met if there's enough above ground supply to meet that demand, which it has been up until now. But will it be a week from Tuesday? And I'm trying to be funny here, Dunnigan, but it doesn't look like there's a lot left. And for that demand to be met, the price is going to have to give. Something's going to have to give. That's one of the statements we've heard from a number of analysts, including John Adams from uh, Australia Economist, who talks about that in any physical commodity market, you can always find a balance point, but that may mean that the price has to move significantly. You've looked at that considerably for your subscribers and others. Um, do you have any... Um, outlook for what you see silver potentially doing this year if the trends on uh, supply and demand and above ground stockpiles remain uh, as we know them now? Well, there's obvious, it's not obvious on the charts or the daily commentators. There's pretty good price pressure to the upside, even though we're off today. And, you know, it's been that way. And it's so frustrating to, you know, to the general silver investor, let alone someone that really knows the numbers and can see behind them, so to speak. But my forecast for gold this year is a high of about 2,500. Silver, I'm looking for maybe a possible touch to 30 or near there. But I think 30, and this is more of a guesstimate than a a knowledge-based statement. That area is really defended heavily. I mean, if you go back to the start of the silver squeeze movement with Wall Street Silver, it's been some time now. And when we got to the near 30 level, just couldn't push through it. And then Rostam Benham comes out and say they need to tap down, the, tamp down the silver market. Are you kidding me? I mean, it's so blatantly obvious if you pay attention and you're objective minded. And of course, I am biased about silver, but I'm also capable of being objective. I mean, that's a fact. That's what he said. Why would someone associated with the CFTC make a statement like that in public? I'm private. Okay, fine. But in public? So I think that this year we will see upward pressure probably by the end of the year. And maybe someone will go rogue. Not necessarily an institution. A bullion bank may drop out. And you may see a pension fund or two or three or sovereign wealth fund or even family offices or maybe just the crypto world where there's more ab you know more people adapting to blockchain based precious metals holdings which i actually forecast may be the big winner in 2024 it may be wrong but uh, you know a lot of these cryptos are based on nothing more than a name and there's no you know they're just a fancy fiat on the blockchain. Well, what good does that do anyone, really? In my view, very little. So I think you're going to see more and more pressure. And the institutions, you know, I just yell out again for the fourth time, where are you? And why are you not participating? 
That's another thing you've talked to us about over the years, and that's the necessity of positioning yourself uh, as the informed money are uh, while you still can. And uh, wanted to get another update from you on the gold-silver ratio. And at times you've recommended that it's so uh, out of far from the historical average that there's a clear value case to be made for even swapping from gold into silver or back from silver into gold. Uh, where, what are your thoughts currently on the significance of the price ratio of gold to silver? And if you think that people who maybe are interested in both should consider swapping at this time, if that was going to benefit them, uh, should the ratio revert to its historical mean going forward? Yeah, it's been uh, advantageous for precious metals investors to swap gold into silver above 80, 85. Uh, <clears throat> historically, we're there now. If you're going to enter the market, you're much better if you have patience to buy silver rather than gold at this point. One thing I want to point out that um, you know I, I lectured on several years ago and was what if silver were treated like gold? And the basis is where is gold? And gold's you know pretty much near an all-time high. And why is that? Well, demand. And you know we just went through the demand thing, which doesn't make sense with silver. With gold, it sort of does because gold has been coveted by the central banks in 2022, buying at a 40 or 50 year record. 2023 looks like it's on track to be similar. Uh, so far, 2024, we don't have enough data. But central banks have been buying gold. It's money of last resorts. They put it on their balance sheet. It's a tier one asset since Basel three, And all these things are favorable to gold. And gold is actually a mainstream investment, even though no one will admit it because you know, they want to keep it quiet. They don't want the public involved. They certainly don't want gold to go rogue. They want to keep it under you know, their management. However, None of that applies to silver. But if silver were act, acted or was treated as if it was a monetary metal, and they had to keep a certain ratio of silver to gold, then, of course, there'd be a lot of buying pressure in silver by the banking system. Again, there isn't. There's really no central bank that has any subsidy of silver, to my knowledge. India used to. None of it was LBMA grade. It was 90%-ish. Oh, it wasn't very much. Uh, but yet, as a monetary asset, uh, not in the you know, banking system, but held by the public and needed by industry the level that it's needed now, uh, there's still a great deal of demand. And if any uh, pseudo institutions or large money, we could say, you know, pension funds, even a bank, I mean, there's nothing to say that the Bank of India wouldn't say, you know, we want silver. You know, we're going to use it as a monetary asset or whatever. It's such a precious commodity, and it's in such short supply relative to historical standards where uh, any significant buying will definitely force the price higher at some point. And I say that at some point is this year. But remember, I use the word significant. If you're able to, through the psychological operations on the monetary system at large convince people that you need to have a piece of plastic or something on your phone and that digits are the only thing that matters, then perhaps my life's work is going to go out the window. I'm saying that tongue in cheek somewhat. But nonetheless, money is either substance or it's not. Anytime it's been just a legal construct, there's been problems. Whenever it's been specie, there hasn't been nearly as many problems. So coming back to basics is an economics lesson, I think, is still in our near future. There are at least 14 states working right now to establish legal tender laws for gold and silver. Sometimes they start with uh, eliminating the sales tax on purchases of gold and silver by retail investors. Sometimes they declare them to be legal tender within the state or for payment of state taxes. Some have even tried to move forward with saying that you can have gold contracts for real estate or other contracts within the, within the state. Do you have an update on where you think this should lead and what you believe is the actual uh, movement that's happening here and where this is, is this leading to a collision of the states versus the federal government if the feds are going towards 
CBDCs or some other cashless solution where you cannot hold the, the, your, your money in your hand or in your pocket or in, or in a vault, uh, but instead that they are in complete control and be able to trace and track everything you do versus the states that are trying to stand up for their people and not allow their, their savings and their retirements and their wages to be destroyed by inflation. Uh, where do you think this is heading? And uh, where do you think the next steps are coming from? One of the hardest things to do in the markets is to determine a top <clears throat> because at a top, there's such exuberance, almost the vast majority is convinced that the trend will only continue. And it doesn't. It's ended or it's about to end. <clears throat> the top of globalism has already peaked. Globalism is, in my studied view, past its peak. And you see that with nationalism, you know, more and more nation states are saying, you know, me first, you know, it's not just America first. There's other nation states saying, no, wait a minute. What about the resources in our land mass? Who owns that? These foreigners or us? So you're seeing the globalism wane. And as that steps down, and this year, 80% of the nation states worldwide get to vote on their new leadership. Now, whether elections are free or fair is another topic I won't touch right now, but there's the biggest possibility of a change in leadership globally than has probably ever been. Potential. Coming back to nation states, I've talked about this over the years, not at great length, but I always saw the change being more and more individual responsibility. So free money means free people. And for free people, they have to take responsibility. And you have to give up the blame game. You have to give up the victimhood mentality. You have to give up it's their fault, not mine. And you have to be responsible for your own actions, thinking, and what you do in real life. And that's happening more and more. And so the state's rights thing is just a natural progression of coming back to what I consider to be the more normal or natural order of things which means that we, the people, get to decide amongst ourselves how we want to be governed. Remember when the whole concept started, it was unique, at least in what we've been taught, that never before had an experiment been run where the purpose of the government was to secure individual freedoms. The only reason that the government existed at all was to protect your God-given constitutionally secured right. The Constitution was a document to secure the rights of the people by the government and as put in writing, so there'd be no ambiguity. Some were inalienable. You couldn't lean against them. You couldn't lean against the right to carry arms. You couldn't lean against free speech. And yet we see, you know, the censorship modality going on. And well, how do they get away with that? Well, not to, you know, put on my legal hat, which, you know, I don't really have one, but well, it's a private corporation. A private corporation can do whatever they want. And therefore, you know, we could censor our platform. Uh, and if you don't like it, you know, who cares? Or we can't take cash. Well, wait a minute. If the national law is this piece of paper is good for all debts, public and private, and this is a debt, why can't I pay? Well, because we're a private corporation. So this is kind of a weasel way of weaseling out of a legal contract. But again, I'm off topic somewhat. The point is what you said, let's get right to it. More and more people are waking up, more and more states are waking up when the power is coming back to the people from the globalists to these big nation states, to sovereign states, to sovereign people. <clears throat> and that's the trend. And it starts with one state, and then it's 14, and then it's just state taxes are removed. And then it is no capital gains on money. If my silver buys me, you know, my ounce of silver buys me five gallons of gas in 2024 and 10 gallons of gas in 2025. So be it. You know, it's, it's lawful money. We don't have any right to tax lawful money. And that's really never come off the books. Uh, so, and one more thing, and this is um, a bit remiss on my part, but I am going to do a podcast on this very, very topic. And I'll include you on the distribution list when I do it. But we're going to try to go state by state. I mean, not all 50, but which ones have what status, which ones are applying, 
and which ones have got the most momentum. The only problem, if you want to call it that, with going back to honest money, which has been my life's purpose, is how do you do it in today's modern world? And the answer is you put it in a depository and you have a debit card that you can charge against it. To put Silver Eagles on the counter and buy groceries is lawful in many states. <clears throat> but what do you do? Do you give change in constitutional silver, quarters, and dimes? Do you pay in fiat? What price do you do? Do you get on your phone and check the LBMA close? Do you get the spot price when the market is still in motion in the, in the United States? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to it because it's treated as a commodity, right? So, but with a debit card system, as long as everybody agrees that we'll use the close of New York the day before, and you clear at that price, and then in the long term, it's all going to balance out. And you get an up day, you might gain a little bit, but you know, unless you're spending your life savings in one fell swoop in the aggregate on a long term average, it's going to work in your favor. It'll be, it'll work just fine. So there's my long winded answer, but honestly. We have to pay attention because, again, not only seeing the top, but seeing what the counter trend is. And the counter trend is clearly there and it's gaining. You and I and my wife spoke uh, quite a bit in person at another Red Pill Expo. I think this was in Harvard, Connecticut. And uh, you were talking about sovereignty of the individual and the proper role of the individual in the state, the role of the state to the, the nation. And, uh, and, it ultimately, the individual to their maker and natural law. And uh, it was very eye-opening. I wanted to thank you on behalf of all of our viewers and subscribers, uh, myself and my sons and everyone who's come in contact with you in person and uh, even over watching uh, you interviewing online because you bring that depth of authentic uh, reality and that taste of what should be and can be and when it will be, uh, will restore the proper order and the proper balance to things that puts the, the freedom and the power and the privacy back in individuals' lives for them to make for themselves and not in the hands of their centralized global or national or whatever anonymous overlords. And I just wanted to thank you on behalf of ordinary people everywhere who just want to be free and want to be able to save the fruits of their labor for their own and for their children and grandchildren's needs in the future um, for tirelessly uh, fighting for that uh, for decades and decades. And uh, part of that is being here with us uh, today. Well, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. It touched me. If I could just add on to that, not about me, but you know, if you go back to like the uh, oh, 1850s, 60s, 70s, I mean, there's always been banking crises and this type of thing. But generally speaking, on balance, you know, the system was working so well that the, um, especially in the West, that, you know, private banks and private free enterprise and honest money and freedom to associate and freedom of speech and all those things were just working wonderfully on balance. I mean, there's always problems, spot problems here and there that the bankers really got concerned. And what they needed to do was consolidate their power. And of course, money is power. So if you consolidate the money, you consolidate the power. So what happened? Well, what happened was the Wizard of Oz. The silver was demonetized. It was made a monometallic standard, a gold-only standard. And then the, that gold road from the Wizard of Oz led to the Emerald City, where they print the green stuff that represents gold. And there's a paper I put up on my uh, Twitter feed, and I read it every now and then. It's really worth the read for any student of monetary history. It's called Gold Standard Equals Fiat in Disguise. And it talks about how a monometallic standard in and of itself is really a mistake. That to have a true free money system, you need to have silver to balance it out. I'd argue perhaps copper, silver, and gold, all three, but regardless, at least two. And it has to be free floating. You can't have an edict that 15.5 ounces of silver equals an ounce of gold. You have to let the market determine that. So if we had a free money system where both the monetary metals were used at least in substance at the banking level, where bank bankers held silver as well as gold as a monetary asset, where do you think the price would be? 
Well, it seems like more and more bankers, uh, central banks anyway, are starting to hold gold as a, sil- as a monetary asset. I don't know about silver. Yeah, they don't, and they, they won't. I mean, part of the whole reason the Silver Users Association was started, in my view, was to make sure it was deemed an industrial commodity only, and that the bullion banks and the silver users could basically um, make sure that uh, they had the vast control in uh, not only the asset itself, but um, the psychology of the asset, you know? Um, and the Silver Institute, I think, is pretty fair and balanced. But you've got to remember who runs the Silver Institute is Thomson Reuters. And for people that don't know, Reuters is, you know, run by the Rothschilds, basically. So, you know, there are ties in all this stuff. And I'm not trying to bash anyone or anything. I mean, the whole idea, the one thing that concerns me, Dunnigan, is the loss of knowledge, you know, for what money is. And, you know, you look at even my daughters that grew up in this house and heard more honest money arguments than most people anywhere. And they're really pretty blasé about it. You know, I mean, they're pretty much, if their iPhone pays a bill at Starbucks, they're good to go. And that concept should be challenged, but it's really not. And so if we can't, you know, win the intellectual war, um, we may have lost, but I'm still hopeful we haven't. One, the power of an idea, two, the economic constraints that are upon everyone. And lastly, kind of a one off, and that's industrial demand being so large that maybe it alone will push the price. Because if that were to occur, because silver never asks, oh, are you investing in me or are you using me for an iPhone or for a solar panel? It doesn't care. Demand is demand, whether it's industrial, institution, or individual. But it's demand. And so it's not over yet. There's less and less available. And I think this year will be a turning point, but not a miraculous, you know, we get to 33 and the bankers lose control. We're at 50 within, you know, two months. I don't see that happening this year, although I couldn't rule it out. So any more questions? I think you're good, Dave, and uh, we really benefit from all of your uh, deep and long knowledge that you bring to this. And uh, next time, what I'd like to do is see if we can do some rapid fire uh, viewer submitted questions. This time we wanted to do a deep dive into this idea of where all the silver is coming from. Thanks for taking us through that uh, in its glory. And uh, also, folks, if you don't want to miss a single episode with David or any of our guests, make sure you sign up for our free newsletter at libertyandfinance.com. Put in your email address, click submit, make sure you confirm on the confirming email and you'll get one email in your inbox per day with our latest interviews, including all of our interviews with David. David, if people want to follow your work and get more of your insights in between interviews, where should they get connected? I'll mention two things. One is the main website, themorganreport.com. And secondly, uh, the documentary I'm working on, silversunrise.tv, all one word, silversunrise.tv. It's all about the stress and angst around the money question. And if you Google and ask what the number one stressor is across the planet, it's money 80% of the time. And that makes sense. I mean, money is, as I've said so many times, you know, the money powers. Money has power over most people. All you have to do is look at the political class and see how many are bought and paid for and vote according to the lobbyists. And the lobbyists buy both sides. They don't care as long as their legislation gets them. They, they don't give a fig about, you know, blue, red, green, purple, polka dot. doesn't matter as long as they get what they want. So um, I've already got uh, G. Edward Griffin, I think one of the leaders in the truth movement on many fronts, not only the creature from Jekyll Island, which is a must read for anybody, let alone whether they're honest money or not, just to understand how the system's been corrupted and how. Uh, but, you know, cancer cures, you know, stuff blowing in the skies. I mean, he has done seminal work in so many areas, and I consider it an honor to have met him several times, be a friend of his, and also be supportive of my work. So check out silversunrise.tv. Excellent. Thank you, David, again for joining us on Liberty and Finance. My pleasure. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 12th through February 19th, 2024, while supplies last. 
First, we feature backdated one ounce silver philharmonics at $3.15 over spot with a minimum order of 50. We also have pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 liberties at $99 over melt and $145 over melt respectively. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.